Hello there, my name's Vince from My Mate Vince, and in this video today we're going to try to fix up this Xbox One controller which has no power whatsoever. So it's got fresh batteries in the back, also if I use a USB cable onto an Xbox or a PC, it doesn't even vibrate. So I've done quite a few Xbox controllers on the channel before, but I haven't done one in a good year or so. This one here is a model number 1708. So what we have to do is we have to get a Torx bit and we've got to undo a screw here, here, here and here underneath these side bits and there's also a screw underneath the sticker here. I'm going to fast forward through all that because you've seen me do that countless times before. Okay we are in. Now there's two boards on here so I'm not sure where the fault lies whether it's on this board or that board. I suppose realistically the easiest thing for me to do is get a working one and swap the boards over to work out whether the fault's on here or here and then it will be a lot easier to fault find. I think as well, I think I'm gonna get a power bank with a USB cable because at least then I can uh, power it up without having to worry about trying to get the batteries connected to the back. Right, okay, I've got another one here. I can't remember whether I fixed this previously on the channel or not, but this is also a 1708. Let's just make sure that it's working. There we go, you heard the vibration. So, you can see that there, but if I was to do that here, no vibration at all. Right, let's swap some boards over. So I just want to swap the boards around just to prove which is the faulty board because there's two boards per controller and it'd be very unlikely for both of them to be faulty. It has happened to me in the past but that was because I bought a job lot of them from the same seller from eBay that knew exactly what he was doing and he was just putting a load of junk together. Still we made for interesting videos and fixes in my opinion. So uh, yeah what I'm going to be doing is just swapping the good boards into the bad controller to see which board is faulty, the front one or the back one. Okay, so we've got the suspected faulty board and we're going to put it onto this one here and then we'll see if it comes to life or not. Okay, so they're both connected together. Now, let's get the USB. There we go. So you see that spin there. So we know that this board is okay, so the fault must be on this board. Now just in case it was some weird reset problem, let's plug this back in. And nothing. Right, 100% this is the faulty board. Okay, so now what I can do is I can compare components between the two and see what we find. First things first, let's have a visual check around the place. So let's zoom right in. Right, okay, so let's have a look around the place. If you're wondering what these things are here, these are the Hall effect sensors. So on these, the triggers are analog, not digital, so they can register varying amounts of movement. That's the magnet there, and it gets measured against these things here. One there, and also one over this side as well. From memory, there's a big chip under here. Right, well I can't see anything wrong with it, so let's uh, start checking for shorts on the capacitors. But before we check for shorts on the capacitors, this video is actually sponsored! Yay! 
And this video today is sponsored by PCBWay. Yes, PCBWay are sponsoring this video. So why would you use PCBWay? Well, once you've designed the world's third most complicated circuit, check this out, rotten neck screen, acting as a switch. Apple, acting as a switch. Banana, acting as a switch. And for you non-fruit eaters out there, acting as a switch. How good is that? And you know where that's from? The same setup as the little gas guzzler car, the water activated car that I did years ago. That was using water instead of the Haribo and fruit, just like I can use my fingers to activate this circuit here. So this is using a Darlington pair. If I was to put one transistor in there, it wouldn't work. You need two transistors to amplify that signal. So the emitter from the first transistor is going through to the base of the second transistor. And that's what allows me to use my fingers or most other things with any water content to actually conduct and make this circuit work. So once you've done your proof of concept there, you can then design a circuit board and then send off the Gerber file off to PCB Way and they will print you out a really professional circuit board in whatever quantities you want. So not only can PCB Way print out your circuit boards, they can also assemble them for you as well. They also do flexible circuit boards, CNC machining, 3D printing, and also SMD stencils. So if you wanted to use solder paste on your project, then you can print out a stencil to help you with that. So they really are your one-stop shop for all things PCB related. Massive thank you to PCB Way for sponsoring the My Mate Vince channel. And now back to the video to check for short on this circuit board. And it's not just a no power issue, that's what I'm working on at the moment, but at the end there's also another strange fault with it. And it's not a boring analog stick fault, this whole thing is very odd. Anyway, let's continue. Not the very first one. I've got a short, but it's seven ohm short. Not on that one. Yeah, I have got it there. Seven ohm, is that on this one? No. No, there's no short there. The first caps I went on. Right, okay, let's just go across a few more. Seven ohm short again. Let's see if that's here. No. Okay. Seven ohm though is weird. That's not like a shorted capacitor, is it? Seven ohm. Seven of the seven ohm shorts everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. So we know if we go into this big cap here that that side there is the ground because look, it's a low reading and that side is seven ohms, but it shouldn't be there. So that's probably why. That's probably why it's not turning on. See, if you didn't have this here now, you might think that that was completely normal because seven ohms isn't a short, is it? It's, uh, you know, like one ohm and below is a short or depending on your meter, it might be two ohms and below is a short. But that there is, uh, that's seven ohms and you think it'd be okay, but it's not on this one. Right, let's solder on a wire onto the bottom of that, onto the seven ohm side. Let's put voltage into this board, see if we can see. Maybe one of the caps has got a partial short or something. Okay, so I've got that on there. Let me just make sure I'm definitely on the seven ohm side. Yeah, there you go, seven ohms. So now I think I'm gonna go one volt and high on the amps, like 10 amps, and let's see what it draws. So I've got my bench power supply here. Right, I've lowered it down to one volt, and let me just see what the amps are. Three amps. I just got to five amps. Okay, so my bench power supply is one volt at five amps. So let's put that onto here. And let's put this onto here. And it's drawing one volt, but only 140 milliamps, so 0.14 of an amp. I can't feel anything getting warm. Oh, 
Oh, annoyingly, I can't find anything getting warm. I was expecting to see something. Is it because it's seven ohms and it's not, uh, you know, it's not like a one ohm short? Right, there's nothing getting warm there at all. So, a cap. I don't think it's a cap because I think it would be uh, a bigger short than that. I think we need to unsolder this shield here and have a look at the chip underneath it. Tell you what I'm going to do because these are going to be in my way. I'm going to take a picture of where all the wires go and I'm going to unsolder all the wires for the uh, little motors in the triggers and also the motors here as well. So while we're unsoldering this, we'll give a shout out to the my mate Vince Massive. They're still here. And the massive members are kitdigital.com, Kip Hakes, Max Rokotansky, Having Fun Repairs, Will Michaelis, Chris Seal, Felipe at MrKeebs.com, DJVG, Pigsy, Robert from Timsey's Auto Air, Daniel Watson, Zeke C, Anthony Dean, Baza2, and Operational 111. Seven. Massive thank you guys. Okay, so this is an ARM chip and it's X905893-002. So looking at the board and looking at the fact that it's got a kind of weird thing where it's 7 ohms, I'm going to take a guess that the chip is faulty because there's not really a huge amount of other stuff on this board, is there? Let's see if the resistance reading is any different now that the chip's warm. That might give me an indication. So let's go ground again. Uh, ground, let's use this, use this over here. Nineteen ohms. So it's different now that the chip's warm. It's a BGA chip as well, so it's not going to be one that's easy to replace. But it looks like you can replace the whole board. I wonder, is that nineteen ohms the same everywhere? So on these two capacitors, nineteen, nothing, or direct short. Yes, yeah, so it's up to nineteen now. You know, rightly or wrongly, I've convinced myself that the chip is faulty because if it was a capacitor fault, I think it would be a direct short, while this just seems to be a partial short, which is stopping it from working. So I looked for my bag of spares and I managed to find an identical board. I've got quite a few spares when it comes to the Xbox One controllers because I bought a job lot from eBay years ago. Now, on this board, I can't just swap it over. Two reasons. One, it will make a very boring video because we haven't even proved whether the chip's at fault. But also, it's got a lot of damage to it because it looks like uh, an analog stick tried to be replaced. They are quite tricky to replace. A lot of heat is needed, a lot of patience is needed to get everything unsoldered. And loads of traces has been ripped and there's been little wires run around the place. So, this is my plan. I don't want to just remove the chip because it's a BGA chip. That means ball grid array has got a load of solder balls underneath it, and it's not gonna happen. If I take that off, it would need reballing to put the next one on there. But I'm hoping I can remove the whole little board that the BGA sits on, because there's a board on a board. So the little BGA board is actually soldered onto the, the main board that uh, goes into the Xbox controller. So what I'm going to do is use a load of low melt solder all the way around the edge and then use hot air. Hopefully then it will lift off. If I was just to use hot air, I think there'd be too much damage to the board done because we're going to need quite a large area. We're going to need so much heat to be able to remove it. But by using low melt solder, I'm hoping then it will come off easier without too much damage. That's the plan. That's what you're watching right now. In reality, this took about 45 minutes to do it. wasn't an easy thing. Even with all the low melt solder, it was still a nightmare to remove. And unfortunately, as I'll show you now in a minute, there was quite a bit of damage done to all the, not all, but to some of the traces. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, this video will have a lot of fast forwarding through because it took me ages to do in real life. 
uh, you wouldn't do something like this in real life because you can get a working controller for £30. You can buy them brand new for probably £35 or £40. I haven't checked the price recently. So uh, nobody in their right mind would do this. Remember, it's just for a video. It's for learning experience. And really, it's for entertainment, isn't it, to see what was wrong. But saying that, if it's your own controller, you might be happy to spend half a day doing it because you might not equate your time to money, especially if you enjoy it. And come on, who doesn't like a bit of fix-it stuff? Okay, that was incredibly hard, even with all that low melt solder on it. Because the thing is, there's no real way to grip the board to take it off. Uh, I'm unsure whether I'm gonna go through with this now because I've got so much repair to do. So you can see all these pads are okay. This is not, this is gone. That goes down to that little via there. That's fixable though. Uh, this one's missing, that goes to that via. This one's missing, it goes to that via. These two are missing, that one goes, I presume, to, no, that one goes to here, this one goes to here. Uh, they're all okay, I think. I need to work out where that goes, whether it's to this fire or this sort of ground. Uh, I need to sort that one out, that goes to that fire, and this one goes to this one here. So there's a lot of work to do. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see how cleanly this comes off, or, do I just forget about entertainment for the video and do I just get it working? I mean, what's going on here? So all these pads have been, these pads have been ripped, haven't they? That's the problem on this one. To be fair, it would be still easier to fix, wouldn't it? Do you know what, I'm gonna take the risk because I'm not doing it for, uh, I'm doing it for entertainment. I'm not doing it for a customer or anything like that. So let's do the same with this one. I'm gonna this time try to put this in some sort of board or holder or something and uh, yeah, let's see if I can take this one off more smoothly. Right, so I really took my time there. There's low melt solder all the way around the edge and I left the soldering iron for a long time in each slot rather than just quickly going back and forth. So really now, all the unleaded solder should have mixed with the low melt. I should be able to get that off a lot easier. Because look, there is no heat pads underneath here. There's this bit here which goes to the other side of the board through this little, uh, through this little hole. But uh, I should be able to do that. Right, let's come along with the heat. I'm hoping this one will come off okay. Oh, that came off lovely. That's always the way, isn't it? So it came off lovely and easy on the donor board. I mean, the donor board's scrap anyway. It makes no difference. You know what? While editing the video back, it's so obvious. I should have started on the donor board first because then I would have realised how much heat I needed. So the secret here was applying the soldering iron for longer on each part when I was using the low melt solder rather than just putting the soldering iron up and down the pins, actually concentrating on holding the soldering iron on each like two or three pins because they're so small and just leaving it there for you know a good 30 seconds or so letting the low melt solder work its way right 
in and you've seen how easy that came off I, I did that in real time there it came off really really easy with uh, I don't think any damage which is fantastic so what I'm doing now is just cleaning up the pads on this replacement chip board and then we need to fix up the broken pads on the good board I really should have done it the other way but I didn't and uh, then we need to put this board back onto the good board and we'll see what's happening then. So I'm just going to show you one of the repairs in real time and then I'll have to fast forward through the rest because again this process of getting this board on I'd say well, I mean it was enjoyable-ish. i say it was probably about 45 minutes to an hour. You know it takes a long time doing all these little repairs. You don't think it does and if you ask me how long would it take before I did it I'd be like yeah 10 or 15 minutes but it doesn't. The time just whizzes by. But you know what they say time flies when you're having fun so uh, yeah there we go I must actually enjoy it uh, yeah that's it let me just show you the real time repair of just one of the traces Oh, that went nice, didn't it? I was sure when I was watching that back editing that when I was bringing up the soldering iron for the second time, I was going to remove the uh, wire completely. But luckily, no, the wire moved a little bit towards the solder blob, but it didn't remove itself, which is nice because normally in instances like that, it ends up on the tip of your iron and you're just like, ugh, having to start again because uh, the wire is so small, it just normally disappears somewhere. Anyway, right, I've got to do that now about six more times, I think it was, or maybe a little bit more to all the other missing pads. And then now I've got to just solder on the board onto every single pad. But that should be easy enough because although they're small, realistically there is enough room to get your iron in there comfortably on each one individually. So it's easier than having to replace a little chip with, for example, a hundred legs or something on it. So uh, yeah, I'm going to play some music, kick back, relax, and uh, hopefully next time you see this, the board will be on and then we can test it. Pay attention, am I about to do something wrong? Does it look okay to you? What do you think? Have you spotted it? Yep, for those of you that said that I've placed it too far down by one lot is correct. How annoying is that? Especially when I'm dealing with something that has got repair little traces on it. But anyway, I use a bit of solder wick on it and uh, luckily in this instance, it looks like I'm gonna get away with it. Yeah, that thing. 
Oh my, oh my, that was an epic. I found it really hard and I'll tell you why. The board is not flat in all areas, probably because I've put solder mask under certain areas. Uh, I don't know if this one is making a connection. I might have to scrape this one away. It seemed to move a bit when I did it. Uh, so you can see now, every single one of them has solder on. I know it looks horrible, but really it's the best, it's the best I can do. There, there, down. What's happened with this one? Did I not do that one? One second. No, I need to do that one there again. And I also need to put on the capacitor here. So I'll do that now. They're okay. And they're okay. So we're nearly there. I had to do it under the microscope. I had no other, uh, no other way. It was too hard. That is now done there. Let me just try to pop this tiny capacitor on. There we go, that's pulled in. Well, that capacitor pulled in real nice, didn't it? I was expecting that was going to be a nightmare because it was so small. Well, I really don't know if this is going to work or not because you see that little board's been through a lot with me yanking it off. Maybe I've messed up the BGA chip before the yanking on it, but... Uh, Let's see, here we go. What do you reckon? I'm gonna say yes, let's be confident. Yes, did you see that? Look, ready, watch this, watch the motor. Boom, fantastic. Let's put it back together and see if we have anything. Okay, so that's the back all puts it back together and all the screws in. I soldered that back on, little capacitors there, resistors there, different board here. Let's now put the back on, put the batteries in and see if it's gonna come to life. Giving it a clean up as well, because there was quite a bit of grime in the grooves here. Right now, is it gonna come to life? Da, 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 da. Result is sync gonna work. Whoop whoop! Wow! Oh my god! I really wasn't actually expecting that. I was expecting having to go back and resolder. Okay, I'm gonna put the screws back in and stuff, but I might need to take it apart again. Maybe there might be one or two little things that don't work. One or two buttons, in which case then I'll have to go back to that chip. Right, I'm going to connect it up to my computer to begin with, do the game tester, make sure everything's working as it should, then I think I'll connect it up to the Xbox. Right, it's good, but it's not perfect because the right trigger is just constantly on. So if you have a look, every other thing's working fine. Left trigger's working fine, small amounts, large amounts, bumpers. Everything is doing what it needs to do, but look at the right trigger, fully on. So let's take it apart again. Let's see if we can trace maybe the Hall effect sensor back and then we might be able to work out what's going on. Right, so these batteries are in series with each other so it's gonna be three volts going into here and we have the positive here so it's gonna be negative positive. Let's put three volts into it. So negative here, positive there, let's turn it on. Okay, so it's on there. Now let's see if we can get some sort of reading off the Hall effect sensor. So this is the one here. Let's see if the voltage will change as I put it down. That doesn't seem to make any difference. Let's go into this one. Oh, 
Oh, that doesn't seem to make any difference either. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, rather than messing around for ages, because I have checked my soldering. I'm going to add some low melt solder to it. I'm going to pop it off because I've got another one here, haven't I? And pop that one on and see if it starts working. If it does, we know it's the Hall effect sensor. I don't really know how to test them. I would have thought as I would have gone down here, some resistance or something would have changed. Actually, let's check for that. Maybe the resistance would change. No, it just seems to be jumping around. No, nope. don't know how to test them. We have the donor board, so why don't we make life easy for ourselves and just swap it over rather than unsuccessfully testing it. Then if it starts working, we definitely know the Hall effect sensor was at fault because I don't actually know how to test them. Now the reason I'm using low melt solder on this particular one is because I'm too lazy to take the board out again and if I use hot air I'm just going to melt all the plastics. So by using the low melt solder it comes off really easy and then it allows me to uh, clean it with the braid and then I can put it back in with the soldering iron without causing any damage anywhere because the heat is localised. If I didn't use low melt solder I wouldn't be able to, well I'd really struggle to take that piece out because you see every time you take your soldering iron off it's going to solidify while low melt solder stays liquid for longer. So now this will allow me to put it back in with the soldering iron using leaded solder. So there we go, you can see it's now going back into place. So now let's bring it back over to the game tester and let's see now, is it going to work? Was this Hall effect sensor faulty? Is that why it was constantly on or is it something else? <laughs> the answer to that is no, it's still not working, it's just on full. So maybe it's something to do with my soldering. So what I'm going to do is let's zoom in and see if we can follow the traces. Right, so that one looks like it's ground, so I don't have to worry about that. Let's follow the other two. Oh, look, <laughs> look at this, the top one, yeah? See this big fat trace going down here, going down here, down here, down here, 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 going along here, going up here, here next to this big one, here, here, here. Look where it goes into this damaged area. So obviously, remember I said that it looked like something moved. Must be that one. Let's scrape all this away. Annoyingly, this thing's in my way now. Let me see if I can take this bit off. Thing is, from what I can see, that goes to a via. So where does it go to? Let's check on the good board. Oh, maybe it just goes under the via to jump her over these, you see. Maybe it goes via to get past these ones. So what we'll do is, let's put a tone onto the top one and see where it comes up. Do you know what, I think this is gonna be fully fixable. So I'm on the top one now. Right, so it goes to there. Then what does it go to? Well, it looks like it goes all the way over to here. Interesting. So these two. Wow. Okay. Oh, we've got continuity there. So what's going on? Right, and if I go on to the other leg here, it goes to this capacitor, then it goes down to 
a little test point here into a wire and it comes up here and it's doing it on both of them. So uh, I think the soldering round here is okay. See what made the chip go in the first place, you know? I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take off the resistor and the two capacitors from the donor board and just pop them on here. Now I'm being naughty here, I shouldn't be putting hot air on the controller I'm trying to fix because all the plastic up here could melt. But you know what, it doesn't take much heat to get these capacitors and resistors back on. But I shouldn't have done it, I should have just used a solder iron to put them back on. But they're so small, it's so much easier using hot air, but I should have taken the board out. Lazy Vince. Ready? Check this out. What? Unbelievable. So. What, dodgy cap or more likely I'd say resistor? Let's see if I can measure the old resistor, see what it reads against this one in circuit. Well, this one certainly has been a challenge and a half. Right now, the old resistor that I took out is that tiny little one there. Let's see if I can get a reading without it pinging off. Nothing. I'm going on that pretty hard. Right, let's try to go on it from the top. It will probably ping off now, but that is open. That resistor's open, look at that. Now, the one I put in here is a 100 ohm resistor. So that's the problem, that is open, how weird. There's nothing there. It's in the mega ohms. Right, let's go on to this one here. Okay, so now we know it has to be a 100 ohm resistor. Weird. Right, okay, let's put it back together and then uh, we'll do the final test. It's really late here now in the UK. Uh, we'll do the final test tomorrow on the actual Xbox. So uh, yeah, I'm just gonna put this together off camera. I need to put up, uh, back together the original controller as well, but it looks like we got there. Right, so it's connected up to the Xbox absolutely fine. And you've seen earlier on the app that everything was working. This is the weirdest thing. So it'll work one minute and then completely, not completely stop, but it will do things like hold on to button presses. Right now, I'm not even sure if our, our, the right trigger's working anymore. It's just completely intermittent with what it's doing. Now it's, is it shooting now? Yeah. Yeah, a minute ago it wasn't shooting, now it's shooting. It is so bizarre. And then when you go to the home screen, it will have drift. The weirdest things are happening with this controller. I don't understand it. I mean, maybe I need to update it. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna update it and see if that makes any difference because we have got a different chip from a different board just in case somehow the boards are kind of not communicating with each other properly. But it is the, it's the weirdest thing because normally on a controller, you have one button that might be intermittent or you have one button or two buttons that are not working. This thing is just all over the place. I couldn't actually tell you what's wrong because it's coming up with a different fault every few seconds. Really strange. Let me update it. And now just uh, applying the update. I'm wondering if this is gonna fix it. Unbelievably, we updated a controller and he's still in the same game. So he, <laughs> he didn't get killed and we weren't even on that screen. There's only 25 people left now. Is the storm going to get you? No. Nah. Does it seem to be working okay now? Yeah, it's fine now. Isn't that weird? There we go, out of the storm. Well, isn't that weird? So since we've been messing with it, it hasn't worked this well. So it must be something to do with the update because I put a chip in from a different controller. That's uh, that's odd, but uh, does it seem perfect now? 
Oh, well, there you go, 17th. Not bad, because you didn't play it. Uh, well, there we go. I suppose successful. If it's not, I can always do a revisit video. Really, really strange. But the whole fault there was strange. The chip go in with a short, a 7 ohm short, and then after all that, the resistor completely blown open for the... Uh, the trigger is just all very, very strange. So, uh, yeah, that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up, and I will see you all very soon. Thanks so much for watching.